Hey, what's up, guys? All right, so we got another chapter of Black Clover out this week, and this was another really short chapter. And just like the last two previous chapters, we don't really actually find out that much information on the demons and forbidden spells and like curses and all that stuff. This chapter, just like like I said, the last two chapters was mostly built around character development. So to start the chapter off, we actually get this very nice color page to celebrate the release of the 22nd volume of Black Clover. It's just basically this picture of Dorothy sitting on top of this giant anteater. Which every time I see this anteater, I just think about that Pokemon. I for, I can't remember the name on top of my head. I have a picture right here on the screen for you guys to see. But basically, every time I see this anteater, it just reminds me of that giant Pokemon. Which I mean, I'm pretty sure even the if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, I'm pretty sure the Dream Eater or the anteater in this picture is the same color palette of that Pokemon. So yeah, I'm pretty sure Tobias just drawing inspiration from that character. But anyway, the chapter pretty much picks up where the last chapter left off. We see Dorothy using her magic to clear the rubble from the capital. And we end up finding out in this chapter that she actually sends all the rubble. And this is kind of like something she does on a regular. She will send destroyed buildings, rubble, all that stuff to her glamour world, which is that dream world that she has full control over. And pretty much more than give us information on the demon or the curses that Noelle was actually coming here to talk to her about. We end up getting more information on Dorothy's dream world, her glamour world, and finding out just how OP she is when she's in that world. Because what we end up finding out is that she can basically send rubble, she can send people that she wants to capture, like enemies, she can send injured people, there in an instant, and she has full control over that dream world. So things that affect real the real world, and like any laws in nature that affects the real world, has no effect over that dream world because of the fact that she controls things the way she wants it to be. And that actually ends up coming into play because after she's done clearing the rubble, she goes to talk to Noelle. And before Noelle can even ask her about the demon and the curse that might have been placed on her mother, she stops her, tells her not to say anything just yet, sends it to them to the dream world. And then she explains to Noelle that basically if she would have talked about the curse out loud in the real world, she would have fell under the curse as well and ended up dying because of it. But because of the fact that they're in her glamour world now, they can openly talk about it without fear of falling under the effects of the curse. Which just goes to show exactly how strong or how overpowered Dorothy is in her dream world. Because even the effects of a demon's curse has no effect inside of that world. I mean, like I said, this chapter pretty much just goes to showcase even more than give us information on the demon. How overpowered Dorothy actually is, especially when she's in her dream world. Because she can teleport people there in an instant. She has full control over the area. And she basically can fight in that area and control it for as long as she has mana which since she has a very large pool of mana is going to take her a very long time to run out so yeah i mean i can't really see outside of her own self how dorothy can be defeated while she's inside her dream world and you know what this could actually probably explain the reason why dorothy was asleep for a majority of the series she probably was asleep because of the fact that using this dream world using her glamour world takes up a lot of mana and sleeping was the best way for her to recover that mana it's either that or she was just basically watching the real world from her dream from the glamour world and basically just letting her sleeping body just like kind of controlling her sleeping body like a puppet from inside of that i don't know that's the only thing i can really explain as to how she was able to move around so much but yeah i'm pretty sure because of the fact that she needed to regain her mana is the reason why she was sleeping for a majority of the series so before we end up talking about what she tells us about the demon and the curse in this chapter i want to quickly go over to the two comedic parts of the chapter that we get Basically, the first part is as soon as they get into the dream world, and as soon as Noelle kind of like starts to get comfortable there, uh, Dorothy summons a dream version of Asta, which is based off of Noelle's hidden desires. So basically, what we end up finding out in this chapter is that Noelle kind of just wants Asta to look at her and call her cute all the time, but she ends up getting very embarrassed by this version of Asta, send them flying. Dorothy teases him or teases her about you know having the hidden desire of wanting to be with that boy or finding out or like help him out. And of course, Noelle and her secondary self gets very embarrassed and tries to, tries to deny everything. And then the second one is actually we end up finding out or finding a dream version of Nozelle that kind of shows up because Dorothy summons him. And in this moment, Nozelle actually ends up going up to Noelle, holding her close and rubbing her head. And he's being like a very doting, very loving brother, which again embarrasses her and she sends him flying as well. And it's very interesting because Dorothy says that that's the version of Noelle that she, or Nozelle that she actually knows of. Which begs the question, is the hard-ass, you know, very stoic, very, like, keep you at a distance Noelle or Nozelle that we've been seeing for the entire series, just kind of a facade or, like, a facade that he's been putting on? 
in front of everyone else and Dorothy knows the real him. I mean, I have a theory that I've been working on that maybe Dorothy might have been just like Mario Leona, a student of Aisha Silva. And that's the re and that could actually explain the reason why she had knows is like other side of knows hell that no one apparently else knows. She, you know, she most likely if she was a student of Aisha, she probably grew up with him during her childhood. So she would have seen some like hidden stuff from him that everyone else after, you know, Aisha died would not have been aware of. Now, even though we didn't end up finding out much information, we do find out two important facts when it comes to the connection between the Silva family and the demon. And basically what we end up finding out is A, officially Aisha Silva did die of a curse from, placed on her by a demon. And B, we end up finding out what the demon's name is, which is, and I might be mispronouncing this, but it seemingly is called Megikula. Now, what's interesting about this is the fact that if you remember back, uh, I want to say chapter 116, 117, Noelle mentioned that the black form that Asta has resembles the demon that her grandmother used to read to her about when she was a child. Now, assuming that the demon that is tied to the civil family, basically because of the fact that it killed Aisha, is the same demon that her grandmother would read about to her, that could mean that we just possibly found out the name of the demon inside Asta's grimoire. Although, if you look at the picture that we get in this chapter of what the demon possibly looks like, it doesn't really match either the black form that Asta takes or the, you know, the black mist form of the demon that we've seen up to this point. So, it's very unlikely that it is the same demon, but there is also the possibility. Now, like I said, we don't really end up finding out that much information about Megikula or how he placed a curse on Aesir. The only thing we really find out in this chapter is that basically demons, like we already pretty much figured, can't exist in the real world unless they are summoned by a person. And basically, they only exist for as long as they have that contract with a person who they pretty much just lend that person their power. And then once that contract is done, they go back to their world. That's normally what happens. But apparently, with Megakula's case and possibly with other demons' case, uh, you know, that we haven't heard of just yet, something went wrong and he was able to stick around in the real world for a little bit longer, or at least some demon was. And because of that, Aesir ended up falling under the curse that she was under. Now, we don't, like I said, we don't end up finding out how she fell under that curse. If I had to guess, I would, I would say that maybe because of the fact that the curse affects anyone who speaks about it out loud in the real world, that maybe before she knew about that effect, she talked about the curse or she mentioned it to somebody and it ended up because of that suffering the side effects of it. But it doesn't, the chapter doesn't go into any detail about it. It doesn't tell us any more information about how she fell under the curse, what the actual effects of the curse were. And whether or not the curse might have been passed on to Noel, because if you remember in my last review, I mentioned that a lot of people, a lot of fans were theorizing that maybe the reason why Noel couldn't control her mana is because of the fact that she was under the effects of a curse. We don't get any official confirmation in this chapter whether or not Noel actually was affected by a curse, but I'm guessing that either in next week's chapter or at the very least the next time we end up visiting this topic, we will end up finding out whether or not for sure she was under the effects of a curse. But that's pretty much all that happens in the chapter, guys. Like I said, there's not really any information that's given to us besides the fact that official confirmation that Aesir did die of the effects of a curse and give us the information about exactly what the name of the demon is. We don't find out if the demon's still around. We don't find out if that's the same demon that is tied to Asa's grimoire. We don't really get any information out of this chapter. It's pretty much just here to showcase how powerful Dorothy is, give us a few comedic moments, and sprinkle a little bit of information here in front of our face to keep us interested. But that being said, I did still enjoy the chapter. But anyway, guys, that's pretty much it for the video. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, drop me a like, subscribe to the channel. I would greatly appreciate it. Comment down below with your thoughts and theories, and I'll catch you guys later. Peace.